Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's uh, colloquium. Uh, today, we are very happy to have uh, Alejandra Castro from Amsterdam, who will tell us about uh, engineering of gravitational theories. Uh, so thank you for uh, giving the talk and, uh, and please go ahead. No, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm very happy to be here to give the colloquium. Um, so I know there's a lot of experts <laughs> in the audience uh, right now and the, 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 the talk that I, I prepared, it's a, it's a bit broader. So, um, um, so I will introduce various things that are very uh, well known for many uh, holographers and, and, and string theorists. Um, but as the, as the colloquium progresses, <laughs> there will be a little bit more of the um, details and, and, and uh, technicalities. But at any point, uh, if you want to interrupt to ask me a question, if something that I'm saying is not perfectly clear, just feel free to interrupt me. I'm, I'm happy to answer at any point. You don't have to wait uh, necessarily until the end. Now, um, so in, in giving this talk, um, I pick a title that has the word engineering. Uh, this is a word that can mean various different things. And so I always feel like I have to explain um, in which context am I uh, using the term engineering? Because we're not engineers, so we're theoretical physicists <laughs> or mathematical physicists. And, and so I want to motivate and give you a bit of the, uh, the cartoon of the, why, why am I using the word engineering uh, in this context and in the context of gravitational uh, theories. So just to be um, a cartoonish, like, okay, if you think about engineering, you, you think that you're going to uh, have a big uh, project, uh, a skyscraper uh, that, you want to, that you want to build, um, then that, uh, that's your project. And of course, uh, as we all know, um, if you're an engineer, uh, basically you have some blueprints that you have to follow, you have some set of materials that you need, and you have tools that, that allow you to, to make this project a success and, and get to this like uh, final uh, end uh, pro uh, product. Now, from my point of view, so we're going to be uh, using this in the context of uh, theoretical physics and, and gravitational physics in particular. So the way that I'm going to be using this as an analogy and, and drawing connections is in the context that I'm going to think of, of the blueprints. So if you're a successful engineer, basically, you have to come up with some original design and meet the various constraints that you, that, that you might have. And so from that point of view, for me, the blueprints is basically the principles and laws uh, that we want to discover and we want to put into play. So that tells us what are we allowed, what are we allowed to design. Uh, the materials in, in this context will be basically the particles, the fields that you have, how they interact, what are the allowed interactions, and the geometry. This will be, I'll make this uh, a bit more explicit as we go along. And the tools uh, are basically the way that we overcome <coughs> a lot of these challenges, like. Uh, I always like to advocate of how we make clever use of, of geometry, sorry, of geometry, of symmetry, so of uh, the mathematics that comes about, uh, basically how we combine, we see patterns and things like that. So it's a, it's a bit like the creative um, part uh, of, our, of our work, okay? So the, the, main, um, the main purpose uh, of what I want to convey for you today is, is basically this, okay? So, uh, basically, what are the principles and laws um, that we should comply to in the round of trying to understand uh, gravity and, and what are basically materials that I'm allowed to use and how to, uh, what are the tools that I need in order to make this a successful uh, endeavor. So uh, to keep things um, slow and easy at the beginning, I divided the, this uh, talk into three parts. So I'll give you a really big picture of like what's going on. So uh, there will just be like, again, more cartoons and, and arrows and things just to put things into perspective uh, for those of you that are not experts. So I'll give you the big panorama of what's going on. Uh, then what I'm going to do uh, is I'm going to discuss holography and black holes in a very, very general way, just to understand what are the basic rules 
So what, what are these principles and laws that we're trying to meet? What does it mean to be like, uh, what am I allowed to design in, in some sense? And then uh, this third part of this colloquium uh, will be the most technical part. So we'll put this into work, okay? So based on what we learn basically from part two, it's like, okay, so how do I build stuff? Uh, what does it mean to, to be a successful engineer in, 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 in this area of work? Okay, so this is the rough um, composition of the colloquium. Okay, so let's start with the very, very um, basic stuff. So what, what, is our, what is our task? So, okay, exploring this uh, panorama. Okay, so as the title said, I'm going to be interested in, in studying gravitational theories and, and in what I have in mind is basically the theory of uh, general relativity. Okay, and so as my starting point, okay? So our modern understanding uh, of gravity is basically the fact that gravity is, is geometry and it's described beautifully uh, by the, the Einstein's equations and all the predictions um, that it makes in terms of gravitational waves, orbital motion and bending of light. And in this new era of gravity, uh, as if, I, if I keep on my engineering hat, there's tons of opportunities. I think gravity has become uh, and, and in particular general relativity, it's no longer an abstract, it's not longer things that we draw these uh, pretty pictures, uh, but it's actually something where there's tons of opportunities. And so as a good engineer, uh, you, feel, you, you feel that you have tons of resources. And just to put it in a modern context, in a new era, we're getting into uh, a more advanced way how to probe, test, and study uh, gravitational physics uh, via observations, okay? Uh, now, this is not going to be the emphasis uh, of my talk, but it's just to put things into context. That a, a lot of the things that I'm going to say, uh, in particular because I will be mentioning uh, black holes, uh, these are not objects that we, we don't have to imagine them anymore. And, and it's quite exciting and, 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 and remarkable in this, in this new era uh, that we live. Now, okay, so what I want to do, uh, basically ba starting from this concept of gravity as a geometrical theory, uh, one of the aims that we have, so is that um, having a good understanding of this theory of general relativity, which is very nice. Our point is that we want to get to be able to understand what does it mean to have a theory of quantum gravity, okay? And in particular, what I mean by quantum gravity, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, I mean string theory, <laughs> okay? Uh, that's, that's my definition of a theory of, of quantum gravity. Now, this, uh, I like to use this Escher drawing uh, of metamorphosis because this is not a linear path, okay? So it's not like I start here and I clearly uh, end up uh, up there. Uh, this is a road uh, that changes that you discover new structures, you discover new surprises, and how, wherever you started, the endpoint might look very different and you might encounter new monsters and beasts along the way, okay? So we don't know exactly how things are going to look. I might be saying the words string theory here at the top, uh, but there are many things that we don't understand fully about what's going on in, in this journey. And, and I, what, what I want to illustrate are basically paths that we take as we go on this journey of understanding what is quantum gravity. And, and here's where uh, we want to understand what are, the, what are the rules basically of taking this journey? What are, what are the tools that you need? Uh, what, are, what are detours that you can also take and maybe discover other interesting uh, paths along the way? And so in that context, uh, there's three concepts that are important as I, as I personally uh, go through this journey uh, that I want to highlight are there are three, uh, cre uh, three key ingredients in understanding this path and are the concepts of the holographic principle, black holes, and, uh, and the use of uh, low dimensional models. Okay, so these are all basically uh, intermediate, if you want, towns that you visit as you're doing this journey of going from uh, general relativity uh, to quantum gravity. And each of these concepts basically are quite uh, intertwined. So the first step in this journey is basically black holes. So the first 
um, objects that tells us that we shouldn't just live down here, but there's something to explore. There, there's something to build and, and there's something to, to get to is, is black hole physics. And the famous result here that tells us that we should not just settle with the theory of general relativity, uh, but we should do more is basically Bekenstein's Hawking entropy formula, okay? So uh, I will come back to this beautiful formula because although it's very well known, I love to talk about it. Who doesn't like to talk about the entropy formula? I love to talk about the entropy formula. So we'll talk about it again uh, very shortly, but this is basically one of the keys, the first step in, in, in going up uh, this ladder, okay? Now, the effect, there's various uh, interesting features about this formula that I will highlight, but one of the most important one here uh, is the fact that the entropy of black hole scale, scales with the area, which is basically, oh, sorry, I flipped too much, um, which basically is telling us that we should be controlling uh, the way, sorry, did it flip? No, I didn't. Yeah, I think you guys don't see that I changed my slide. It got stuck. Unstuck yourself. I think you don't see my slide changing now. Uh, no, we still see the, the same slides. Yeah. Okay. Why are you not changing slides? Okay. There. Okay. It reacted again. Okay. So now you see my pointer. Okay. I don't know why I decided to. to quit. Okay. So um, what, as I was saying here, this goes like an area along and what this is important is that, and, and it's the main, it's one of the main precursors to the holographic principle is that um, in, as we enter this quantum are arena and getting into the theory of quantum gravity, uh, we should think in a holographic way, okay? It was one of the precursors most like core uh, laws that basically tell us we should think of gravity in terms of this principle, okay? So that's quite important. Now, okay, that's a change. Um, now, the other thing that I want to highlight as well uh, is the fact of uh, the, the study of this uh, holographic principle from a low dimensional uh, point of view. Uh, it's very common, uh, it's not the only thing that we do, but I, I do study quite a lot low dimensional models and it's because it gives uh, at least to me, a lot of precision and control. And I should say that um, despite the fact that they're lower dimensional and you might claim that they're too simple and, and we live in four dimensions, we don't live in a low dimensional system, uh, a lot of lessons have been learned from studying low dimensional gravity. In particular, even if you don't care about holography, even if you don't care about string theory, uh, you might not be interested in those subjects, that's fine. Uh, but uh, if you do care about uh, general relativity, I think one of the most important lessons of low dimensional models, besides its implications in the holographic principle, is the fact of, uh, about how we understand the phase space, uh, how we understand gauge symmetries in low dimensional models, and, and they define asymptotic symmetries. And this has been quite important in the role of gravitational scattering in recent uh, years. So the the, the way that, for instance, the BMS group uh, acts on the S matrix and impacts um, uh, a lot of these uh, theorems, this Weinberger theorems, uh, are a, a lot of these, these precursors to these results are motivated by how we understand low dimensional models of quantum gravity. But okay, uh, this is not what I'm going to be discussing today, but just to put things uh, into perspective of like the utility and the and the, and the precision that these models gives us, the wisdom that they, they carry. But okay, so, so these are basically the, the topics uh, that I will roughly uh, cover and what I want to, uh, what I will be highlighting here. So we're going to be studying a lot these low dimensional models of gravity. Uh, and I'm going to be using various tools in, in, in on those models. I'll be using concepts related to modular forms, to supersymmetry, uh, to conformal field theories. So you can view this as my materials and the tools that I'll be using uh, along the way. Uh, and basically what I want to do is that I want to connect um, the, the lessons that I learned 
uh, by studying low dimensional models, what do they teach me about black holes? And basically the most prominent thing is what these, do these low dimensional models teach me about the holographic principle? Okay, so how to uh, have control on, on, those, on those models. So that will be uh, the emphasis. Very good. So with that, we'll turn to the second part. So that's just the big picture of what's going to go on. Uh, and basically roughly the punchline, okay? So there's their engineering analogy and, and how does it fit into uh, this, this area of quantum physics. I'm sorry, I should have mentioned my building, the big skyscraper is when I get to understand what quantum gravity is. So that's the end point of this, <laughs> of this project. I will not get to it today, just a spoiler alert, but <laughs> this is what we're trying to, to get to. Um, this is the thing. Okay, so uh, let's go through holography, so through some of the basic concepts, and, and we'll start from the, the realm of black holes. So this is where, again, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, black holes very quickly and put them into context. They're just too wise. They're, they're too smart. They know too much. Okay, so uh, just a recap, so as we stated at the very beginning, uh, gravity uh, is geometry, as we've all learned in our course uh, of general relativity. Uh, and one of the things that is extremely fascinating in, in the theory uh, of general relativity is just that you can uh, basically find solutions where the space-time curves to an extreme, okay? Uh, and it's a, it's a region of space where not even light can ex escape, and that defines basically is the defining property uh, of a black hole. Now, uh, I'm going to I'm going to be talking about black holes from a theoretical point of view. So I am not going to be uh, talking about those beautiful pictures of the Van Horizon Telescope or the gravitational waves, the collisions of black holes. Uh, so let's let's try, take instead this journey. So I will keep on drawing uh, cartoons. Uh, of black holes, but they don't have to be in our, in our imagination, just to remind you that uh, you can also think of them in a realistic context. Okay, so in, uh, from a point of view of a theorist, uh, there's many aspects of, of black holes that are quite simple. So basically, uh, this region that defines uh, where light cannot escape, so this that I'm drawing as this uh, red circle, which is a sphere, uh, is basically the, the radius, the size of the event uh, horizon, okay? And it's determined by the mass of the black hole. And the event horizon, its definition is that basically it's the surface where nothing uh, can escape, okay? Now, what is so special um, about this black hole? Well, you know that uh, as this cartoon that I've been showing quite a lot, you can throw things into a black hole, the black hole uh, will get bigger. And so there's a very intuitive um, reason why the black hole carries information, it carries mass, okay? So it, it has stuff uh, inside of it, okay? Just, just because it, it, it has energy. Uh, but one of the questions that you might wanna know is basically how much, okay? So if you do experiments with black holes, if you probe them, can you quantify how much uh, information they carry? And this was one of the, one of the important revolutionary results was that, uh, yes, they carry entropy, uh, which is given by this formula that I mentioned at the beginning, the Bekenstein Hawking uh, entropy. And moreover, uh, they comply with a law of thermodynamics that basically tells you that the rate of change, uh, a change of mass of the black hole is basically controlled by what we call the Hawking temperature. So this is this TH. Uh, times this entropy by a change of the entropy in this way, okay? So they also have this uh, thermodynamic uh, nature. And this, to be honest, it's quite, quite, quite <laughs> uh, surprising. Uh, so th there's, a, there's a few things to be odd about here. So first, we're odd by the thermodynamic nature uh, of black holes. Uh, second, we're odd that this is basically the black hole is occupying a volume. Uh, it's not uh, just defined. Well, there's a size that it, it's defined by. Uh, but the thing that is surprising here, the first thing that that asks you is that 
the, the, the entropy, well, the carry entropy, but the carry entropy that is controlled by the area of the event horizon and not, and not the volume. And so this uh, basically is telling us that there's at least uh, two important lessons to get from this formula at the minimum. Okay, there's, there's, many, there's many lessons to, to have, but at the minimum, you should uh, keep in mind that the, the computations in the 70s that lead to those results tells us, first of all, that gravity is a theory that knows about thermodynamics. Uh, this was not an input, this is an output. The fact that you uh, can quantify the system, uh, the dynamics of black holes using the laws of thermodynamics was not expected. A black hole is just one classical solution. There's no coarse graining uh, or nothing of that sort that goes into these computations. So this is already uh, quite remarkable. And then the second lesson uh, that this is indicating to you is that the way that the system behaves is basically seemingly of something that is uh, one dimension lower which indicates to you that gravity should be thought in a holographic way, if you wanted to account for this in terms of new degrees of freedom. Now, uh, from, from this point of view, you also, so, so once you, you're confronted with this formula, more than one question arise. So um, you, you also want to appreciate that in this formula, something that is always important to highlight and why I have kept uh, units uh, until now, I will get rid of units in <laughs> a very short week. And, and as a good theorist, put all of my units uh, equal to one. But uh, if you wanted to understand what the origin of this, uh, uh, of this entropy is, so if you want to go from thermodynamics to a statistical interpretation, so basically what are the molecules that account for this entropy, what, what actually gives you this thermodynamic behavior, it is something that uh, our most precious constants of nature, the speed of light, uh, G Newton and H bar. So trying to understand the origin of this formula means that you have to understand how things, uh, objects that are very small, that move at very high, uh, high speeds and are very massive. And this is the basic characteristic of what it means to talk about. Uh, quantum gravity. So an understanding of quantum gravity is basically going to provide uh, uh, an account, an, an explanation of why uh, this is showing up uh, in general relativity. Okay, so this is why this theory of quantum gravity should provide uh, these answers. And to date, uh, the most successful way have we had to understand this and why uh, black holes have entropy is in the context uh, of string theory. String theory for uh, a wide variety of black holes can tell you why this is, this is happening, okay? But what I want to do today, uh, I want to take this, uh, this, this concept of an area law and put it in the, um, in the con uh, take this as, a, as, a, as the key point of saying, I need to understand gravity and this holographic uh, Wait, so let's review what does it mean to have this holographic principle. So how do I understand gravity from a holographic way? So for me, holography is a can of soup. That's it. <laughs> so uh, if you go to the store um, and you buy a can of soup, um, basically you can read the label on the outside and if you read the label in the outside, you know everything that goes in, can of soup, okay? So gravity here will be basically, gravity will be the soup in the middle. And, and what this area law of black holes tell me is that everything that you need to know about the soup that is inside, uh, you can know it by reading the label outside. And that's it, that's holography 101. That's all you need to know. So more formally, basically, when we talk about holography in this context, we're basically saying that if you have a system, uh, the boundary completely determines the interior, okay? Now, let me be a bit more formal. So this is just a, a, a cartoon. So the, the more like precise uh, definition uh, of, uh, of holography as a proposal is that a gravitational theory indeed 
dimensions is basically equivalent to a quantum field theory in one dimension lower, uh, where this quantum field theory basically does not have gravity on it. And holographers like to do uh, various sketches of this to illustrate how to think about gravity in these holographic terms. So here I've drawn two sketches of how to think about holography. So one is very similar to the can of soup. So I have gravity here in the middle of the cylinder and the quantum theory lives here on the edge. Uh, this arrow indicates that basically, if I know everything about the quantum theory, I can basically understand what happens inside of the gravitational theory. The other way that we like to depict it uh, is uh, in, in this way that where we put the quantum theory, like, let's say on a plane, and then the, if you fill the interior, there's a gravitational theory. Uh, just to be clear here, I'm putting the quantum theory in most of the examples that we understand very well, and there's very precise statements. This quantum theory is not like at a finite position. Um, the quantum theory tends to be asymptotically very, very far away, but it's very difficult to draw that. So we just draw it as, as if it's like cut, um, just to be clear. In any case. Uh, a little bit of jargon for those of you that are not holographers. So when we, so sorry, we had here the gravity theory and the quantum theory. A lot of times um, um, we refer to this as the bulk and the boundary theory. So this is the best way how to spot a holographer if you hear someone uh, around the quarters talking about bulk and boundary. <laughs> you know that someone working on holography. Okay, very good. So now um, what I want to do uh, so before we move into the more details, let me tell you a bit more about how this, uh, what is the status of this holographic principle uh, from the point of view uh, a, of string theory and a bit also a broader than that. So we know that this, this proposal as, as given to us, it, it's working because it was basically uh, incarnated in the context of, of string theory. So here I'm drawing again, but basically you have a gravitational theory in the bulk and a quantum theory. In the boundary. Now, from the lessons that we have in string theory, uh, this duality is quite uh, powerful, it's quite robust, and you can tweak parameters inside it. So something that will be important as I keep on talking is that, for instance, um, before I just said gravity theory, I wasn't very precise about what I meant about gravity theory. I didn't tell you if it was classical or quantum, but in particular, let's say that if you put a classical theory of gravity, so let's say, for instance, general relativity plus your favorite uh, amount of matter, what we have learned from, from the instances in string theory is that this should be related to a quantum theory at the, at the boundary. But this, count, this uh, boundary theory is very strongly uh, interacting. Okay, So this is what happens as you tweak things on one side it also has effects on the other one. And this is one of the characteristics uh, of the correspondence. You can also do the opposite. So you can have a very quantum theory of gravity. Um, and you can be in a very deep like string uh, theory regime. And this also affects the theory of the boundary. We'll see this uh, soon. Also that uh, it will basically make the theory and the boundary be very weak. Okay, so this is also what's known as the strong weak uh, type of, uh, of duality. But okay, um, but in any case, so most of the time what I will be interested as an engineer is basically I will be interested in, in this type uh, of form of the duality. So have, trying to have an understanding uh, of the duality uh, when, when I'm here in the context of general relativity in the middle, and then there's a strongly coupled uh, theory in, uh, at the boundary. Now, in this context, it, it's always um, so, sorry. Um, so in this context, uh, I wanted to review when do we understand better the duality and what have been the successes of it and the test of it. And the cases that we understand the best are the cases where the theory of gravity is a theory that has a negative cosmological constant. Uh, this is what uh, we coin uh, ADS uh, gravity, and the quantum theory uh, at the boundary is basically uh, a conformal uh, field theory. Okay, so when when we have the most control in the correspondence and how the dictionary works, how you relate things on both sides are basically 
uh, uh, these uh, instances. This is what we commonly call the ADS-CFT correspondence. So we write here down in the middle ADS and the theory of the boundary is what we call this uh, CFT. Okay, now, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, so this is something that maps basically anything that you do in the gravitational theory in principle should be mapped to the CFT. And one of the things that I mentioned, which also happens in this instance is that when gravity is classical, so if here you have general relativity, then uh, the CFT is strongly coupled. I, in my engineering test, this is quite powerful because it actually tells me how to define in some sense uh, quantum gravity. So the promise of, uh, of ADS CFT or of holography is that uh, the dual CFT in some sense should tell me how to define observables in quantum gravity. Okay, so things that I get confused about and I, that I don't know how to move away from this classical point here, in some sense the CFT should tell me how to move away from that uh, classical uh, region. Okay, so this is how we're going to be using it uh, today. Now, the, to brag also about what people have been doing in the community, there's been quite a lot of success uh, because of this relationship between gravity and quantum field theory. Uh, it creates a lot of synergy. And I, I could just spend an entire colloquium just talking about all the successes of ADS-CFT and all the magnificent things and beautiful relationships and, 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 and phenomena that has been described through this dictionary. So here I just listed a few the quark womb plasma and high TC superconductors, uh, non-relativistic systems. Nowadays, lots and lots of stuff about the real, how to understand uh, both gravity and aspects of quantum information in this context. So this has been quite, quite prominent. So th there's a lot of things to explore just because as a subject, it just connects many different corners of theoretical physics. Um, and then, and, but I'm not going to be talking about all of these things. There's too many things to say in the context of holography. Uh, but I did wanted to highlight three open questions that I think are important. And then I'll dive into uh, one of them that it's going to be the rest uh, of this colloquium, which will be the more uh, technical uh, part of the colloquium. So one of the open questions that uh, has been very, very, very prominent in our field, and it's basically just about understanding what are the laws, what are the principles, like what am I allowed to do and how am I allowed to do it? One of the most, uh, um, one of the questions that has fascinated a lot of people is basically uh, how to explore every point of the geometry using basically the boundary theory, okay? So the most dramatic of these, um, uh, of these journeys will be, uh, let's say that if in the middle, in here in the interior of ADS, you have a black hole. And so this will create for you an event horizon. I just drew it as basically a boundary like this, just to be cartoonish uh, and yeah. But in any case, uh, if you imagine that you're in a rocket ship and you want to venture into a black hole, what is that process from the point of view of the boundary theory? Answering those type of questions, of course, will answer things like the information paradox and so forth, but this is like one of the holy grails of like being capable of fully describing uh, every single possible um, trajectory that you, you could take. Uh, a second open question, uh, which is also very important is that at some point, uh, there's also quite a lot of interest and pressure in moving away from this example of ADS uh, CFT. So, we, our universe, for example, is not described by a space, uh, it's not gravity with negative curvature, it's gravity with positive curvature. So basically, what is the, the form of these correspondence? If you, if you get rid of, of this part, if you get rid of this ADS, what do you replace here? How does the dictionary work? Uh, these are things that people are working on. Also, if you don't have any uh, cosmological constant, you would also like to understand what are the rules, uh, how do you establish uh, relationships. Uh, th these are interesting questions that are still in progress on how do we design these theories and how do we use the holographic principle in this context. Now, the third question that I want to spend time with you, uh, and this is where I'm going to put on again fully my engineering hat, 
is basically, um, even for the cases that I have ABS, okay, so cases that we feel more comfortable with the holographic principle, uh, one of the things that we, we're still in the process of understanding is basically, what do I need to do here fully? So can I, um, how can I design quantum field theories such that the outcome is just general relativity, okay? So we have various examples of the correspondence. I'll dive into this in more detail into a moment, but basically this is one of the questions about emergence of space time. So if I give you a quantum theory here, uh, what does it mean in terms of defining for me a theory of gravity uh, on the other side? Okay. So, sorry, so do you mean GR or do you mean some sort of quantum? Anything, in some sense I mean anything. Okay. <laughs> uh, we'll go through both cases. We'll go through all cases. Uh, it's. So like you want, I want everything. So I want to have full control. So I want to be able to design whatever I want. So I want to know exactly what do I need to specify here such that I get my favorite theory of gravity on this okay. side. Yeah, okay, thanks. So I, I'm going to be like a micromanager from that point of view. I, I really want to know uh, how, like, yeah. So we'll, we'll get into this. I, I, I'm happy to be more like, um, in some sense, what I want at the minimum is just to have a low energy effective description here. So that's how I'm going to phrase that in the last portion of the talk. Uh, it doesn't have to be just GR, but at the minimum, I want to know um, what are the, uh, the sufficient conditions on, on this theory such that I get a low energy effective theory of gravity where the gravitational sector is described by the einstein hilbert action. Okay, so with that, let's dive into the technical part. So, okay, so now here the experts uh, will start being less bored. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll dive into the technicalities in this last uh, 20 minutes. Very good. So uh, the question is this one. So, okay, so I want to, I, I really, really want to decide quantum gravity starting with a quantum fear, okay? That's that's the point. Now, uh, we have, as I've been advocating, um, we have concrete examples in string theory about the duality that are born uh, from our understanding of, of string theory. And here I listed uh, some of the very concrete examples that we have that have been studied the most. And I also order them, I order them by the number of dimensions that there are in ADS, uh, but also, in, also from my point of view of how much is known about the duality and different regimes of couplings and parameter space. Okay, so I, you're, you're happy to disagree with me or not for those that are experts, but from my point of view, the example of ADS CFT that by far is the best understood and we have the most information is the example of uh, ADS5 CFT4 in particular when type 2B string theory is dual to N equal 4 uh, super young nose. Okay, uh, we don't know absolutely everything. There's so many things that we don't know, but I would say by far, by far, this example of holography of ADS CFT that we know the most. Uh, then in second place will come the example of ADS4 CFT3 where we have M2 brings an AGM theory. And oddly, this is an example I like the most, but I think it's one that in comparison to the other two, we actually know the least as a concrete example. There's a lot of things that are known about ADS3, but um, the D1-D5 system is the example that I will have in mind about ADS3 CFT2, uh, where you have a very, very concrete 2D CFT and a very, very concrete theory of gravity. Uh, but the parameter space here in this case has not been explored as much. It's, it's, it's quite, quite difficult uh, to understand things about the dual CFT outside some range of parameters. But in any case, those are very, very specific examples. But I'm not satisfied. Uh, this, this is good. <laughs> it's excellent. Uh, it, gives us, it gives us a framework, a starting point. Uh, so I do not object to that. To that. Uh, but I want more. Um, so what I want to, I really want to understand the fundamental mechanism of ADS CFT. Why is it working? How is it working? And, and how can I think about this also a little bit um, 
I, I want to divorce for a little bit string theory, I, not for good, uh, because I am a string theorist and I will come back to it, but I, I want to basically try to view and say, what are the principles, what are the laws that are telling me that why this is working and what am I allowed to do in a more like landscape uh, point of view. So there's two strategies that you can take. Well, there's many, but I will take today two strategies in this context. And so I'll phrase, I phrase them as the following question. So the first question that I want to um, discuss with you guys is basically, okay, so if I give you a CFT, how do you see that it's dual to a theory of quantum gravity? Okay, so you grab your favorite CFT and I tell you, wait, it should always work because, okay, it might be that sometimes the theory, the dual theory is very quantum gravity, maybe sometimes it's classical gravity, but in principle, if I hand you the CFT, one should be able to identify the gravitational field, okay? Whatever that is. So how do you think about that? So we'll talk, I'll briefly uh, go about uh, that question, but then the more important, um, the, the maybe the, the more challenging question is basically trying to understand what is the space of conformal field theories that can uh, basically capture a classical, uh, the classical properties of, of gravity, okay? So where I can get to this low energy description, which might not be just pure gravity, but gravity coupled with some other light degrees of freedom. So how can I characterize the space of conformal field theories that have that property, okay? Uh, is it one isolated point or do I have regions uh, in the space of conformal field theories? Like, how does that look like? What am I allowed to do? And also, what does it tell me about consistent uh, theories of gravity that might have a completion uh, that I can move away from this classical properties? Okay. Very good. So, uh, I'm going to address these two questions. So we'll, I'll tell you some of the results uh, from the past on these two questions, and I'm going to do them in this context of ADS3 CFT2, okay? Uh, a lot of the tools that I'm going to use um, uh, are very specific. So in this context, a lot of the things that I'm going to say are not going to extend immediately to higher dimensions, but I think it illustrates the challenge about like, how do we think about gravity from this perspective? Okay, so I have a, a conformal field theory and I wanted to, I wanted to define gravity uh, and, and what does that mean? Okay, so how, how do we go about it? Okay, so let's look at first the, the first question. And uh, I'm going to go through some uh, old uh, results of mine to illustrate how, how to phrase this and, and what does it mean? to, if I hand you a CFT, uh, how to make it look gravitational. So take your two favorite conformal field theories. Uh, here are my two favorite conformal field theories um, and that are also quite famous and prominent in condensed matter theory. So take the icing model and the tricritical icing models. Uh, these are theories that fall under the Brasoro minimal model classification and their central charges are quite low. So this is a theory with central charge equal to a half and central charge equal to seven half. Okay, so they're conformal field theories uh, that characterize uh, systems of, of spins and at their critical point, they become uh, conformal. Okay, uh, so those are my two favorite theories. Uh, and uh, you can ask yourself the question, well, sorry, and this, these conformal field theories, one of the, the observable that I'm going to focus on, the thing that I'm going to look at is their partition function, okay? So basically uh, the states that they have, that's what I'm illustrating here. So uh, the partition function as a function of the complex structure tau and tau bar is basically a sum over uh, states uh, where the, the states are labeled by the irreducible representations of the Verasaro uh, algebra. So this is just, if you've never seen this before, it's perfectly fine. Just, it just means it's a sum over states. Now, the question is, okay, if I grab these two CFTs uh, and I'm a strong believer of the holographic correspondence, you might ask, great, you have that partition function for that CFT. Can you write it as a gravitational partition function? What does that mean? Okay, uh, so how can you see that these CFTs have a dual that is a path integral uh, for gravity? 
Now, here you have to tell me what do you expect. So part of this game also is like, what does it mean to have a gravitational path integral? So it, it's part of the emergence question of what does it mean to be dual to, to a CFT? And in this context, how we defined it uh, to be dual, we basically said, well, in principle, there should be some path integral of this gravitational uh, theory. Uh, so this is what I'm illustrating here. There should be a path integral uh, over metrics. And from a, a point of view of uh, just uh, symmetries, um, if, you, if this has a geometrical uh, description, there should be different saddle points in this path integral that will describe uh, what we usually call thermal ADS and, and uh, the BTC uh, black hole. So these are the black holes that occur in this lower dimensional version of, of gravity. Now, um, if these are the two, sorry, so, so in terms of these two geometries here, uh, basically it means that in terms of states that you have in the theory, you would have basically empty ADS, which will be this, <coughs> this geometry here. And then the black holes will appear at some energies and basically fill up uh, the spectrum up above, okay? So this is roughly what we expect um, of a theory uh, of graph. Now, more precisely, uh, how this path integral should then organize if these are the types of configurations that you have in your gravitational theory, um, the, these, uh, these sums over these different geometries basically admits uh, this, this form. So in mathematics, it means that um, if, you, if you start with one geometry, so sorry, I should have kept the image there. So uh, what I call the vacuum is basically this uh, thermal uh, geometry here, uh, having a sum that includes this geometry and the BTC black holes geometry means that you have the sum over the modular group uh, of this form. I can explain this more in detail um, if there's any questions at the end, but basically I want to sort of uh, boil down this gravitational path integral to something that has a simple form in terms uh, of the structure uh, of the geometries, okay? Now, in terms of answering this question, so can I get from the CFT partition function to this gravitational uh, partition function? The answer for these two, for my two favorite CFTs is yes. So can you write this complicated expression such in a way that it looks like this? Yes, you can do that. So in some sense that tells you, that gives you an indication that uh, maybe the, the IC model written in this way does not look very gravitational, but you can reorganize that sum and make it look in this way. And if you make it look in this way, it has the hints of what we believe to be uh, the basic ingredients that go into a gravitational description. Okay, because it will include something that you could interpret as these different solutions that we call thermal ADS and the, and the BT set black holes. Now, there's some important remarks here. So this sounds great. And then you will be very tempted to grab any CFT that you want and go through this exercise. But uh, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. Uh, so this is, I am being, um, I'm cheating on you because I basically pointed the two theories for which we have been successful at this, uh, but in general, if you pack, if you grab your favorite uh, Verasoro minimal model or your favorite CFT, um, you will not be able to. They, they will have a partition function that looks like this, and you will not be able to write it in this way. Okay, so most of the time it doesn't work. So it means that what you thought the gravitational path integral should look like, it's a bit naive, and, and you should generalize it. I should also say that this gravitational theory that I'm advocating for here is a theory that is very, very quantum. Uh, this will be more clear in a couple of slides. So I'm not really getting to the point where I can say, oh, I have this classical view of general relativity. No, so the, this is, it is a duality that we're, we proposed, but it will be one where the, uh, the soup is very dense. It's very quantum soup, okay? It's not classical, it's not GR soup. Now, the other way that people have tried to overcome this, so in the in recent years, oh, I forgot to add the references, but in, in recent years, people have taken this definition uh, more seriously, and they basically noticed that 
and this is what I'm advocating in this last point, that there's, um, instead of trying to match this sum to a single CFT, what we can do is basically see how this sum uh, is, is equal to a collection of CFTs, which changes also a bit in the rules and, and how we understand holography quite a bit, but it has been a different approach that people have taken that they noticed that uh, collections of CFTs basically uh, can, you can write their partition functions in this way, which is also quite interesting. But okay, uh, so this is one, one strategy and like how to basically uh, engineer holography uh, starting from the conformal field. Now we're going to go to the second question and uh, that's the last uh, part of this talk. And now I want to ask the question, well, the previous examples had this very, very quantum theories of gravity. That's not what I want. I want to be able to characterize very classical theories of gravity. Sorry, Alejandro, maybe just curious precision on the previous slide. You maybe hiding somewhere, but I'm just wondering on these gravitational functionals, do you have any constraints? Uh, are you constraining them in a sense of a kind of a bootstrap? I'm just wondering. Uh, you mean like, like what I would be able to do on you know, for the three critical model or, or the Eisen model to isolate the islands? Is there something like kind of a constraining analog of the of the bulk bootstrap or, or not? Well, the bulk is a little bit mysterious because it's a very quantum bulk. Mm -hmm. um, the central charge here is very very low. These theories won't have problems of factorization or anything like that. They will be they're completely unitary theories. And so however gravity behaves, it's it's all fine. Uh, it, there is a strong implication here that for instance, this theory has a finite number of primaries. Um, and so then you would say, like the thing that is mysterious from this point of view is that in some sense, it's telling you that there's a finite number of BTC black holes. So this sum of our images, uh, usually um, there's uh, there's infinite. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Averaging, averaging over which BTC configurations, right? Exactly. It's telling you that if you're in this very, very quantum regime, there's only like, um, um, I think there's only two black holes. So you will always have the vacuum configuration and then you have two types of black holes. <laughs> Which is funny, like, because you will say, what happened? Why are they, why from a, from a gravity point of view, the other black holes that naively, uh, you might have thought that you could uh, sum over all my images are not allowed. Uh, but the, the issue is that I don't have, uh, besides uh, these coincidences, I don't have a very good working independent definition of what this gravity theory is. But it's a prediction from the CFT, if you wish. The CFT is yeah. telling me that when you go to this very, very quantum regime, uh, only very few black holes survive. And, 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 and this is not a theory where the masses of the black holes can be arbitrary or continuous, uh, that you only have discrete values for the masses of the black holes, based on the fact that this thing has finite number. It's a kind of a quantum constraint. And OK, that's exactly. Yeah. Effect. All right. Yeah. No, yeah. and it would be, uh, yeah, I, unfortunately, I don't have, like, this is, these are all predictions from the CFT. It would be great to say something independently from a gravitational perspective, but I, I don't, uh, I don't have an independent gravitational definition. Sure, I see things. Thank you. Now that's a really good question. Um, it does work a little bit better. Yeah. So if you do the averaging, then I, I should say there's some papers, uh, some recent papers that revisited these questions and they did, there were more examples that were successful in, in this category. But okay, but let's now take, I do want to get to classical properties uh, of gravity. And here, uh, this is work that I've been doing in the past year, and there will be uh, two more papers that will appear soon. And I do want to highlight um, that I have some fantastic collaborators, new collaborators. So um, Luis Apolo, who's a postdoc here in Amsterdam, uh, Susana Pintaya, who's a PhD student, uh, Jill Du Hollander, who's a master's student, are working on this recently. 
they're amazing. <laughs> they're they're truly truly amazing. I I I, I applaud them. Of course, I, I've been working with Christoph Keller and Alex Bellin for a long time on this, and my previous PhD student uh, Beatrix. Um, but right now, I, I really I need to brag about these three people. They're 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 truly fantastic. It's like please keep an eye, especially when Susanna applies for postdocs and Jill do. Uh, she's applying for PhDs right now. Like it's like. I am speechless. Great, 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 great people. Uh, way smarter than me. Okay, any case. So they, they put all the hard work in a lot of these computations that I'll very briefly mention to you. But okay, so I want classical gravity. So what do I mean by classical gravity? It's basically that I have the Einstein helper action and couple um, to, to matter, okay? So in terms of the spectrum, uh, I want uh, perturbative states that will be allowed. Basically, there will be uh, what we call the boundary gravitons that come from here, and basically perturbations like wiggles that come from the matter fields uh, are also allowed, that's fine. You will have heavy states, which are these BT set black holes that we're talking about. And in general, depending on what this effective low energy effective theory of gravity is, you might also have more solutions and more configurations. Now, if this is your starting point, which is the usual starting point when we start talking about gravity in, in ADS3, one of the universal entries, and that's why these other examples that I was referring to are a bit ill from that point of view, is that the relationship between the central charge and these couplings that appear here, where this is the ADS radius, is this one. And for this to be a valid description, uh, means that this number has to be very big. And so I'm forced to look at conformal field theories whose central charge is very, very, very big, okay? So that's why these examples were not, they're in no way related to an action of this form, okay? Because the central charge was very small. So, but now I want to, I, I do want to talk about this case where I should be able to have some description along these lines, okay? Now, the basic requirements, uh, which were beautifully uh, summarized in this paper from more than 10 years ago by now. Uh, what, what I mean when I write this equation is basically that I want to have gravitational theories where their low energy descriptions is given by a local effective field theory, okay? So that's what I mean when I write this. I don't want higher spin gravity. I don't want something that is not local. I, I, I do want just my, my usual like semi-classical uh, approximation, okay? Very good. So that's what we want. So now, we want to set up, so this is the endpoint from the gravitational point of view. So now let's think about, okay, let's imagine that as theorists, we're all mighty and powerful, and we know what the space of conformal field theories is, okay? For a second, I know we don't. We don't know what the space of 2D CFTs is, and let's assume that we do, and it's illustrated by this green uh, circle, okay? Let's assume that we know, that we know all the CFTs, okay? And CFTs are usually determined by the spectrum of primaries, the OP coefficients, and their central charge, okay? So there we go. This is base of CFTs. Now, what we suspect is that out of the space of CFTs, there will be some of them that I'm going to carve. So not all of them, as we saw, not all of them are uh, give me semi-classical gravity, but some of them uh, will give me semi-classical gravity and that's what I'm going to call holographic CFTs, okay? Now, in the space of holographic CFTs, the, the defining property that I have based on the two requirements that I already told you before, so the things that I, I want them to have is that I want them to have very large central charge, that's a necessary condition, and uh, there's also this condition that I want a very sparse uh, spectrum. So what does this sparse spectrum mean? Well, from the point of view of the first picture that I had, sparse spectrum basically means that I have very few states. So you have the vacuum state, and then there's almost nothing. You can have some stuff around here, but very, 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 very few. And then at some point you get to the black hole threshold, and then you have a lot of states. But the sparseness condition basically means that you have very, very few things there in the middle, okay? So above the, the vacuum, not a lot of stuff, okay? Now let's put this, this notion of sparseness can be made more precise in the context of ADS-3. So let me be a bit more precise of what we mean by sparseness because 
uh, you want to count things in, a, in an efficient way. And so what does it mean to be sparse and what are, what are we expecting from a string or an effective field theory uh, spectrum? So usually in string theory, not always, but most of the time we have three scales. We have the Planck scale, the, the, the string scale, and the ADS scale. The Planck scale basically tells us where black holes start to be dominant. Uh, and then we have these two other uh, scales, the string and the ADS uh, scale, okay? Now, it, when I say that I'm in a very stringy regime, okay? So where the spectrum, uh, I have all the string states, uh, being relevant, so the strings are very floppy. It's a regime where the, the, the string scale is very, very close to the ADS scale, okay? And our usual expectation is that when these two scales are very, very similar to each other, the growth of states uh, grows exponentially with the conformal dimension or the energy of the state. And then this is what we called a, a Hagen-Dorn uh, growth, okay? So this is, this is usually what happens if you're in a very, very stringy region. This is the Hagendorf growth of, of, of string theory, okay? So this is, if, if you have a CFT that gives you this, you would say, ah, this is not classical gravity. This is like a, a string theory, okay? Now, uh, we don't want that. We want a separation of scales between the string and the ADS scale. So we want the string scale to be way up there. So all the string states become very massive and we don't see them. And so we have just this low energy effective description. So we want this hierarchy, the, uh, the separation. And if we do have that separation, then we expect the growth of states to be much smaller. So it can still be exponential, that's perfectly fine. But the power here of this exponential has to be strictly less uh, than one, okay? Otherwise you will get to the Hagendorn growth again, which is the maximum. So you want this to be much, much slower. So when you have spectrum like this is what we call the supergravity growth, which is a slower uh, growth. Since I'm running short on time, yeah, time is flowing. Uh, let me go through this quickly. So, all right, yeah, this is it. So now from this point of view, so these are our conditions uh, on the CFT, the sparseness and the central charge conditions. Now we, we do want to understand, okay, so what were CFTs that meet those two criteria? And given that we don't know the space of all CFTs, the green region, um, we made a decision to say, okay, let's carve out a different space of conformal field theories, which are going to be the symmetric product orbifold theory. So these theories are basically just uh, tensor products, so repeating, you have one theory here and then you keep on repeating it uh, a bunch of times and then uh, saying that the permutations are all uh, equivalent, that's what it means in, in two seconds. Uh, but basically we want to ask, uh, out of the space of theories built out of this way, how many of them intersect with this red uh, region? Okay, so how many of these theories at least are holographic uh, CFTs? Or at least that we can say that they meet some of the criteria that we have been imposed. Now, for symmetry enters, but we're imposing here The three necessary conditions that were product or refold is the charges for lots of repetition for them to be very sparse. So this is where we make use of super. And then uh, another thing, this is a technical point, uh, is that we want a marginal operator. So the symmetric product or refold, technically speaking, describes the weakly couple point. But uh, we do want to, so the symmetric product or before basically is a case where the string scale and the ADS scale are equal. But if we have a marginal operator, uh, we believe that maybe we can reach that strongly couple point where we have a separation uh, of, of scales. But okay, in concreteness, these are the three conditions that we're imposing uh, on these types of theories. And the punchline is that I know what the intersection is. So I can tell you 
uh, out of these uh, supersymmetric conformal field theories that meet these three criteria, we basically have, uh, there's some small caveats, but we basically have a complete classification of that intersection. So that's what we've been uh, doing. It's not, again, I, I was putting this warning before, sorry, sizes here are not meaningful, meaning like <laughs> sizes of the circles, maybe the, the blue is like, very small <laughs> relative to the space of all CFTs or how many of holographic CFTs encapsulate in this way. So I don't want to, it, it, I'm just being cartoonish here, but uh, at least uh, if I restrict myself to this class of conformal field theories, I know all of these, period, okay? That meet this criteria. But then the name of the game is, I impose necessary conditions. Are they sufficient? So if the CFT satisfy this criteria, could you make a case that the dual gravitational theory, which I have not identified yet, is actually a low energy, local uh, effective uh, field theory? We don't know yet. <laughs> so that's why we're still working on it. But basically, um, one can uh, nail these things down. So some of the next steps and what the next few papers are going to be about is basically the effects of these marginal operators. So how certain operators get lifted and acquire anomalous dimensions. There's also very interesting multi-trace deformations. Um, the basic question that you might have is like, okay, we talked about the CFTs and various of these properties, but uh, there's a lot of things that I haven't told you, and it's just because there, there's a lot of theories here, but we have to decode them. It's like, what would be their interpretation from a string theory point of view, from a supergravity point of view? How does this interplay with thinking of, of the duality in an average sense? And uh, this last point, it's related to uh, how black holes behave in, 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 these, uh, in these contexts. So there's a lot of the, the, the laundry and list is pretty long. Uh, but at the end, what I want to illustrate with all of these steps is that what is not clear from uh, having met this criteria is basically, are these conditions sufficient? This is all I need in terms of constraining my design. I don't know. It's part of the game, okay? So this is part of understanding fundamentally uh, what does it go into uh, using uh, ADS-CFT as a definition uh, of um, basically a classical gravitational dual. Okay, but with that, I think I'm not going to skip, I was going to show you some stuff about what are the exact theories that we have. So they're basically the ones that we're studying the most right now, they are N equal to minimal models, which is a lot of fun, minimal models keep on hunting me, but I'm not going to go through this. This is just to show that, yeah, we have equations and formulas. <laughs> but let me get to the conclusion because I'm a bit I'm over time. So this will be very quick. Uh, yeah, my task continues. Uh, I have not finished the, the building yet. I'm just trying to understand how am I supposed to design it and what am I supposed to buy in terms of materials and, and what tools do I need? Um, but I hope you guys had fun in going through this journey about talking about black holes, about low dimensional models and about how we understand uh, gravity uh, in this holographic view. And I was trying to make all these connections and, and kind of trickle it uh, with this cartoons in the, at the end of the, at the end of the day with some or limited success. <laughs> but in any case, this is where I want to end. So I want to thank you for your attention. And as this lizard that sometimes lives in a plane and sometimes goes out of the cage, uh, this is how we're understanding quantum gravity nowadays. So thank you. Okay, thank you very much. For a very nice talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much. So are there, uh, other questions? Um, maybe uh, some generic one. Alejandro, I'm wondering the following. Uh, in ADS, okay, it's maybe from my perspective, uh, there are a number of claims uh, where people are studying certain uh, 
EDS3 integrable background, which consists of certain integrable manifolds uh, of their products. Uh, but people don't quite understand what would be the corresponding dual. They understand that there are several candidates which could be symmetric orbifold product series, which are exactly uh, two dimensional CFTs, but they are not quite. I'm just wondering, but this is exactly the, the other way around. Yes, like you, you understand this uh, super CFT too. Uh, and I need uh, to understand. Uh, what... I would understand the gravitational part, but uh, for, for for some of them, there are candidates, but no understood un, understood on the on the uh, con conformal side. Uh, and I'm wondering, but there are the the integral the, the whole feature is that integral properties that arise on this ADS3 process three say backgrounds and the other types. There are many of them actually. The whole family. Uh, these integral properties are very special. Uh, I, I think it, it would be very interesting to see if they are reflected in, in, in one of those uh, super CFTs that you are. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, if you have like yeah, the thing here. So usually the thing I'm that- I'm just wondering how, yeah. Yeah, so the first thing to match is like what, one of the reasons why it wasn't super easy for us to match the, the gravitational dual is that we know that uh, these um, uh, there, there's no S3 in our constructions. Uh, so it's not ADS3 times S3. Yeah. And the reason why we know that- there's Like sigma no, models, yeah. Um, no, it's because the S3, what it gives you, it, it very easily, if you have an S3 and you haven't broken it, uh, it will give you n equal four. Yeah. And all of our examples don't have, uh, well, minus, there's only one family that has n equal four, uh, which is very similar to the D1, D5 system. But in our case, uh, all, of our, all of the symmetric products that we were successful at, at, at meeting this criteria need to be n equal two. I see. So you can't oh, have- This is the argument that you mean with the minimal models. Yes, yes. Okay. So, so I can't have, like the S3 has to be broken in such a way that, um, uh, the the supergravity theory the number of supersymmetries per serving on the uh, on the ADS3 side has to be 2,2 2, not 4,4 4, not 0, 0,4 yeah 0, 0,2 which is very common in a lot of these constructions that people break the S3 but they break it in a way that it's very like mild like they break one of the SU2s or yeah mm -hmm. now and then, yeah, uh, so, but there are, there are some recent papers that studied, like they, they manage, I know some papers by, I'm forgetting now the name of the author, there was a, yeah, there, there were some papers this from this last year uh, that they had some Italian authors and also a postdoc that used to be here in Utrecht. Um, and they, they managed to build some n equal two backgrounds of ADS3 that I, it's in my to-do list to, to look at them, but uh, that, that sounds promising. Um, and then there's also some work by Alessandro Tomasiello and collaborators. I don't know if maybe that also is part of what you were referring to, but uh, they also have managed to find more ADS3 backgrounds that don't have this S3. And so I also have to look into those to see what are the symmetries. Um, because in some sense, we have uh, the thing that I can report to them. I know what the BPS spectrum is. Uh, so there's some, like, if they can also tell me what the BPS spectrum is on their backgrounds, like, this is something that one just goes back to the literature uh, in the late 90s by Jan de Boer and other people, and you can see, like, does the yeah. spectrum of operators match? Um, so we all of those expressions we have them from the CFT. We we know what the large end limit behavior of these theories is. We tell you these are all the quarter BPS states that should be part of your supergravity uh, uh, fields are, but we just don't know what the supergravity theory is. So, but if we if these examples are known, then one can start doing these computations and just see does this thing match or not. Yeah, yeah, I, I see your n equals, n equals two uh, argument, uh, uh, but I think anyway, if the if if this metric overfold exists, I think they, they must lie in this overlap that you that you show. It's just yeah, mm. yeah. But we basically have like a, a if you give me like 
we have the, the thing that we have basically developed is that if you think that a symmetric product or default should be holographic, we know the tools how to diagnose it. Like that, that's what we're pretty good at. I see, like, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that that we can tell you, like in especially my my prior student Beatrix, like you, you like she she will be able to tell you very quick. Like there's we we have some code and some of the students of Christoph also like they wrote some code and so basically you tell them what the elliptic genus of this theory is and then we'll tell you in two seconds yes this will work no this will not work. Um, so so that that we became that that's where we became very very efficient. I say good useful. So hopefully we can understand more CFTs this way, but yeah, right now this is where we're at. I see. Thanks. Any further questions? Uh, hi, can I, can I ask a question? Yes, yes, I am. Uh, okay, so. so um, so, so as you mentioned, your favorite models are uh, uh, minimal models, and they, yeah. of course, they of course don't have any supersymmetry. So I was just wondering if there's anything you can. Oh, say. you can have, you can have supersymmetric versions of the minimal models. Okay, so but but yeah, uh, mm. they're they're not so they're the Verasuro minimal models where the central charge goes up to one, but then there's other coset constructions that are also um, there, uh, you can have n equal to Verasoro uh, minimal models. Okay, so that's very nice, but yeah. uh, but then uh, like you lose all the power of supersymmetry. In particular, you want to have some marginal operator, and you want to compare. Ah, the, but the, the, the construction the here is always supersymmetric. Yeah, no, no, no. The construction here is always supersymmetric. Yeah, I don't know how to do the symmetric product or default. If it's if you don't have supersymmetry. Um, the problem is that, um, yeah, so, so that's why, like, when I, when I started drawing this, this circles, like here, it was important that I always had a supersymmetric, uh, theory in mind, because when I deform by the marginal operator, we're deforming by something that, uh, it's built out of, um, half BPS operator. Uh, and so I preserve supersymmetry along the flow. Um, right, right. And preserve supersymmetry as well. So, but we th these examples that we have, they do have that type of moduli. So, but, but, but is there any chance that? Well, I mean, it's like on the surface, that's that's end of the story. But uh, is there any chance that uh, for some reason, you know, you can, you know, something may work for non-supersymmetric modules? Yeah, but it's like conformal perturbation theory is already a bitch. <laughs> Uh, I don't know what the um, yeah in principle you can deform by any like you you it's just that yeah if if the theory is not super symmetric um, you can still deform by something that is marginal at the at like this like free point but then the operator itself by which you're deforming is going to also become anomalous so it's going to stop being marginal. So that's why it's not exactly marginal operator. Yeah. So that's why I wanted it to be protected so that I didn't have to worry about the existence of the operator in the whole like moduli space. But um, yeah, in principle, you can do it. Of course you can do it. You can do flows like, uh, but I like in principle, like I just don't know, like I, I, I would feel very sad to tell this to a PhD student. To oh, yeah, right, right. You know, <laughs> like if you're very optimistic, you can say, well, maybe you don't know if there is a flow, but uh, let's say you can compute the spectrum and, uh, you know, yeah, so, the CFT compared with uh, you know, so gravity, observe it, those things agree, and then maybe. Yeah, so that, that, that's a, that's actually, no, so that's a good point because I should say, so in this, so we're, we're going to report on some of this stuff very soon when we compute anomalous dimensions. And actually, okay, I, I don't know what the end of the story is, but this is part of like a, a lot of lore also that goes behind it is what we believe that will happen on how things, how the mechanism is going to work. But one thing that we're noticing is that when you look at how uh, states start lifting, and so you start um, developing this gap uh, in the spectrum, uh, the, the actual values depend a lot if the operator was BPS or not. So the corrections that you get, and so I think if we if we do if we have more data about like how 
these deformations are basically Im implementing the separations of scales, we can have a better understanding of like, oh, why do you need a BPS operator to, to get to the, the supergravity regime? Why can you not just do it with something that breaks supersymmetry? What a special, like, why do we need supersymmetry to talk about holography, like about ABS CFT? Can we have like reasonable examples where we don't have uh, supersymmetry? And so we're, we're finding a little bit of evidence about like what are like different uh, actual values that you get, but I don't like, yeah, there's very little, like even for D1, D5 people, there's very, very few computations on like what happens if you actually deform D1, D5 from the free point. And so, yeah, it's, it's quite appalling, <laughs> like the, the lack of information. <laughs> Uh, even for the case that that we where this whole thing started, but it's an excellent question. Uh, also, what does it mean to deform? Um, to these deformations that we've been looking at are single trace deformations, and you can also like multi trace deformations are also super interesting. They affect the the, the interactions, the three point functions, and stuff. And then it also hasn't been explored. Like what what is the effect of that? Kind of, could you get like for instance, you might ask, uh, maybe the matter that you have in the bulk, you want it to also be strongly coupled. So you want QCD in the gravity theory. Can you add multi-trace deformations to do, make the matter be strongly coupled and have other phases? Like, is that a possible thing that you can do as you're designing these theories? And so we do have multi-trace deformations. And so it could be something that you, but yeah, it, again, there's like very few papers that discuss this. Uh, in general and but yeah so there's lots of things to do and to understand how this works thank you, thank you. Okay. any further questions then uh in view of time let's just uh, thank alejandro again alejandro again for the very nice talk and the nice discussion thank you no uh, thank you guys uh Okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and yeah, well, yeah. I hope to see you in Dublin soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I hope to see you in person again soon. Yeah, yeah. so thank you all. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.